today on Ag News Daily. We really look at the convergence of the biologicals category, agronomic practices, and then the economic output. Many times the market will interpret return on investment simply in terms of the yield right. improvement minus the cost. We think it's broader than that. When you think about soil health, when you think about nutrient use efficiency, that comprehensive value that's provided is bigger than just yield. Welcome to the Ag News Daily Show and happy National Ag Week. That's right, Tanner. This week across the nation, folks took to social media and various events to celebrate the ag industry. We saw many organizations had different charity events, donations, and more to celebrate the week. Cargill also announced on National Ag Day on Tuesday that they were donating more than $3 million for a grant for the National FFA organization. The three-year grant is earmarked to support and shape future agriculture leaders. The grant supports a variety of national FFA organization programs, including the organization's sustainability platform, their equity, diversity, and inclusion pathway, and the Living to Serve program. Were you an FFA member, Tanner? I was not. I was in 4-H. All right. Well, we'll give you a pass on this one. But I had the pleasure of attending the first ever F3 Future Farmers Forum held at the World Food Prize alongside many other movers and shakers in the ag industry here in the state of Iowa, including our good friends Corey Hillebo, Mitchell Hora, Rachel Fishback, and Nick Hansen, as well as a few politicians and dignitaries, including Secretary Mike Nag, Ambassador Terry Branstead, Congressman Zach Nunn, and Congresswoman Miller Meeks Tanner. So that was a fun event to kick off National Ag Week for me. Well, it sounds like you got to hang out with all of my friends (laughs) during National Ag Week. But as we wrap up National Ag Week, we also wrap up another week of varying weather conditions. So let's dive into the weather weekend weather headlines from across the United States. We're expecting a snowstorm to arrive across the northern plains and upper Midwest Thursday into Friday. And a second storm will be arriving over the weekend into early parts of next week. Minnesota and northern Iowa could potentially see more snowfall in the next few weeks than they have seen all winter. A band of six or more inches of snow is possible along the North Dakota and South Dakota border. This will travel through the Midwest into lower Michigan this weekend. Some rain will be possible near the Lowe's track, which may get some decent showers along the southern side of South Dakota and the Nebraska border through into Iowa and northern Illinois as well. While winter weather conditions are attempting to slow down the planting in the north, growers in the south have gotten a significant head start. As of March 17th, Texas reported 34% of their corn and 27% of their sorghum acreage has already been planted. There is a second low-pressure center that will develop right behind it, coming through the southern plains Sunday night as it moves into the northeast through the Great Lakes region on Monday and Tuesday. Another round of increasing rain and snow is likely in the eastern plains through the Midwest. So that's what we've got for a little weather look here at the end of the week. We're already getting some weather, winter weather mixed here in Iowa. It's nice to see a forecast come to fruition. (laughs) Well, this week, the ag community banded together to support farmers and ranchers devastated by the wake of the Smokehouse Creek Fire, the largest wildfire in Texas history. Officials earlier this week were able to confirm that the fire has been 100 percent contained and now the rebuilding process begins. Many farmers across the nation have joined forces to help those in need. Earlier this week, farmers from Missouri and Arkansas, in partnership with Denali, a leading organic recycling company, were able to collect more than 700 bales of hay, or about 385 tons, to be delivered to a Texas A&M livestock supply point. This donation will be distributed to ranchers by Texas A&M and will feed hundreds of cattle for weeks to come. Tanner, what a heartwarming story, and really to see the ag community come together, especially here in National Ag Week. That's right. But I tell you what, it's time for a fertilizer market update coming from Josh Linville of Stonex. Urea is taking center stage as India announced its eagerly awaited urea purchase tender. The problem is they have a wide shipment window, which is extended now till May 20th. We await eagerly, although the speculation leans towards the bearish trend due to this extended time frame. Meanwhile, concerns loom over Europe's offline plants that are showing little promise of restart amid the political uncertainty. 
Additionally, anticipation builds as Chinese exports are expected to resume normal rates in May. This could potentially impact international markets significantly. Moving on to UAN, tight supplies are dominating the scene right now. They're exacerbated by low starting inventories and production issues. Retailers are facing tough times securing the product with demand outstriping that supply for March and April. NH3 is facing potential disruptions from geopolitical tensions in Russia and Ukraine. Domestically, we have tight supply and conditions will persist following a large fall run that we've discussed here and a brisk spring demand. Lastly, the potash market in the stability rate reigns as the market continues to keep pace this spring. We are providing a little bit of a glimmer of hope, Delaney, amidst the chaos of the fertilizers in fertilizer industry, but that's about the only hope we've seen. Yeah, and we do have an interview with Josh Linville on our YouTube channel, so we encourage our listeners to go check that out. That's right. As I've reported before, there is a plan to enhance customer engagement and streamline operations at Bayer Crop Science Divisions. They've unveiled their dynamic shared ownership that was spearheaded by their CEO, Billy Anderson. After a successful trial period in Illinois, the DSO squads comprising of eight to 14 members have been rolled out nationwide. The self-managed teams aim to optimize customer support by integrating functions like financing, marketing, and product supply. Robertson here has emphasized the model has an emphasis on being customer-centric with an early success showcasing increased opportunities in crop production and seed sales. Of course, the goal is to enhance the customer's experience and foster stronger partnerships within agricultural retailers. As Bayer embraces this transformative shift, Robertson underscores the company's commitment to innovating relationships and delivering unparalleled customer experiences. So I'm glad to see that it got started off on the right foot. That's right. And he is the first CEO to come from the United States. All other CEOs have been from Europe. I did not know that. Well, after John Deere finally filed and won a $16.3 million lawsuit against Kinsey Manufacturing and Ag Leader Technology, they now have apparently made peace after announcing a joint collaboration earlier this week. The joint agreement will make it easier for farmers to use each company's respective technologies and integrate the different solutions into their farming operations. The technology combines the equipment and digital solutions offered by all three manufacturers, and farmers will now have the ability to integrate their agronomic data in the My John Deere Operations Center from all three of those different platforms, Tanner. You don't see collaboration like that very often. That's right. This is a big deal for the ag industry. But in response to concerns of the nation's electric demand and surges, the organization Advanced Energy United has issued a groundbreaking scorecard that will assess the efficiency of seven regional transmission organizations that are responsible for coordinating the electricity flow to two-thirds of American customers. Results revealed mixed performance with Texas and California both earning Bs while other regions scored C or lower. The special committee will allow grid operators to defend their practices. They will be expected to cite ongoing reforms and address challenges such as financing and supply chain disruptions. The summary reports will be provided to various committees in Congress for consideration of funding and further infrastructure build-out plans. I looked at the scorecards, though, Delaney, and uh, they seemed backwards. The areas with rolling blackouts appear to have the higher scores, the better on an A to C scale, while the others seem to score lower than expected. It is interesting that they are using a graded scorecard like you might get in school as well, but doesn't sound like a very straightforward system, Tanner. One thing that does appear straightforward is a continued push for clarity on eminent domain as it relates to the carbon pipeline systems. Iowa legislation this week introduced in the House would enable people to ask a court to decide whether a pipeline project deserves the power of eminent domain. The House committee approved House File 2522 on Tuesday, which may impact landowners in the state of Iowa if passed in the Senate. The legislation gives citizens the ability to challenge the legitimacy of eminent domain proceedings in the Polk County District Court before a ruling from state regulators. The new bill would also allow landowners and pipeline companies to seek earlier court decisions about whether eminent domain is appropriate for utility projects. As the law stands now, those who oppose pipeline projects must wait until the Iowa Utility Board's rule on a permit and then challenge it in court. Opponents of the project want state lawmakers to make it easier to appeal the IUB's decision in court, 
More to come, Tanner, on if the Iowa House will pick up similar legislation. Yeah, everybody wants an easier path. Demand has outpaced the funds that are available in RAP. The U.S. ag sector seeking over $900 million in aid to regain overseas market lost to competitors like Brazil and Russia. The USDA has received applications for more than three times the $300 million initial budget allocated for the first round of this five-year export promotion plan. The Regional Agriculture Promotion Program, RAP, announced last year that it aims to assist the industry in accessing new markets for American crops. Funds in this program must be used to diversify markets with a focus on expanding into southeastern Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. The U.S. aims to capitalize on the growing middle class and increasing buying power of those regions. We know, Delaney, that Brazil overtook the U.S. last year as the world's top exporter for corn after several years earlier doing the same for soybeans, and it looks to do the so also for cotton. Russia years ago surpassed the U.S. on wheat exports. So, Delaney, we will see if this kind of program will have an effect on U.S. crops and what we can do for foreign markets and the U.S. farmers. Well, yeah, that's right. And, you know, we compete, continue to compete with Brazil for that number one, number two spot on both corn and soybeans. So it'll be interesting to see how that market opportunity develops. That's right. But a big congratulations is in order for a good friend of the podcast, Mitchell Hora. Had I known this announcement was coming earlier in the week, Tanner, I might have grabbed a soundbite from him at the National Farmers Forum. But nonetheless, Continuum Ag and Siouxland Energy Cooperative of Sioux Center, Iowa, announced an agreement to provide farmers a path to receive potential premiums associated with the Carbon Intensity Certified Grain Score, otherwise known as the CI Score. Continuum Ag will provide farmers the certification necessary to participate, while Siouxland intends to be a buyer for the certified bushels. The goal is to offer premiums for certified grain and capitalize on the pending 45Z Clean Fuel Production Tax Credits. But Tanner, this one certainly wins headline of the week here as we continue into our final story. Earlier this week, the Magnetic Ag newsletter shared what I think should win this week. Tanner, researchers in Thailand and Vietnam recently conducted a study suggesting that python meat may be the answer to our global food crisis. That's right, Delaney. With many folks around the world concerned about the sustainability of protein diet centered around beef, pork, and chicken, these scientists showed that python meat might be a great alternative. Or addition? (laughs) I don't know. But according to these researchers, their study suggests python farming can not only be competitive with existing livestock systems, but it may offer better returns in the term of production efficiencies. I know I'm not going to get my wife to eat any snakes. (laughs) During the study, the snakes were fed weekly, measured, and weighed over a 12-month period. On average, they gained 46 grams each day. Along with the massive rate gain, females also produced 50 to 100 eggs each year. So what do you think, Delaney? Would you eat a snake egg? Uh, I'm going to be hard-pressed to do that, but maybe I would use it as pet food, just not well, for that's myself. That's a good idea. That's what I thought, too. But while we're on the topic of food, biologicals continue to be poised as a great way to feed our plants and soil. We caught up with Mick Messon of DPH Biologicals at Commodity Classic a few weeks ago when they shared a huge headline with us as they look to quantify the true value of biologicals. Tanner, let's dig into that conversation with Mick now. Let's do it. Mick, we are so excited to chat with you. You've been on the podcast a few times for our listeners, but for those new listeners we have catching up with us, give us a little bit of your background. Well, it's great to be here, Delaney. So my background um, is is rich in agriculture. I grew up on a family farm in Nebraska. I went to school at the University of Nebraska, spent the first 13 years of my career at Syngenta, and then I spent about nine years at uh, DuPont Pioneer, which became Corteva and became interested in biologicals and some of the more entrepreneurial companies and transitioned out a little over five years ago and have been leading uh, DPH Biologicals now for almost three years. Well, that's great. What a great history and a way to move into today's Commodity Classic. The show down here is exciting, full of innovation. So what is DPH excited to talk about with attendees today? Well, first of all, we like being out here and interacting with our farmer customers and some of our technology and distribution partners. We're really excited to be able to continue to share uh, with our customers the results from our uh, portfolio. So we've expanded our research and development efforts since the new leadership team took over in 2021. Uh, We've conducted over 100 trials on SP1 alone. And so uh, we're looking forward to having those conversations with growers and retailers about Territory of SP1, 
Uh, Companion Max ST recently launched uh, BioControl uh, seed treatment product as well as Residues Complete. Our listeners are very familiar, Delaney, with Teratrove SP1. They are, yes. We are, we're talking to them quite a bit, and we've talked about that quite a bit here on the podcast, so we appreciate some of the connection points there. But Mick, before we really dig into some of the big announcements you have to roll out here at Commodity Classic for growers, I want to take a moment just to call out the fact that recently DPH Biologicals made some big moves when it came to ownership structure and I think really continues to affirm just the belief that the leadership team has in the company and what you guys are doing for farmers. So talk to us a little bit about the recent sale that you've had here for the leadership team. Yeah, so we joined uh, Douglas Plant Health about three years ago and at that time it was part of a larger company, Douglas Pest and Packaging. And over the past two and a half to three years, um, as the ownership group uh, decided on the best structure moving forward, uh, we came to the conclusion that DPH Biologicals, as a standalone company focused on agriculture, uh, was the best place for it. And as a result, uh, the management team had an opportunity to conduct a management buyout. So we're privately owned. A majority of the ownership is with the management team. Uh, we think that's great for alignment with the farmers and the ag retail and ag distribution channel to align those uh, interests, if you will, and we're really excited to be able to serve farmers. So I'm sure with this management team as the new ownership, it allows you to not only pivot, but listen to your customers and develop your products directly to their needs. It does. Um, many of us grew up on farms or in agribusinesses. Um, as I mentioned in my background, working for two you know, leading agricultural companies, it's yeah. great to have that experience then to be able to apply it in a smaller, really focused company. Um, so not only can we develop products tailored to the needs, but we understand the cycle. You know, it's a once a year uh, planting season. It's a long selling cycle. Relationships are super important. Right. So I think in terms of expectations and pace, there's a general alignment there with the market. That's great, Delaney. Well, Tanner, they've made some really big announcements. And this leadership team, it seems like, is really getting ready to take charge of the biological space because you at Commodity Classic rolled out a big announcement that you are working to quantify the comprehensive value of biologicals, which to me seems like a tall wow. order to Com fill. Did you just say quantify the comprehensive value? I mean, that's, that's right. That is just big in a sentence, not alone <laughs> big for agriculture. Yeah, Mick, those are some those are some big shoes for you guys to fill. Talk to us about what the thought was behind going down this path. Well, first of all, if you walk around, you see a lot of biological companies, right? And so farmers um, are not lacking for biological companies trying to sell them something. Ag retailers are getting called on frequently by bi biological companies, and so we see an opportunity to really demystify the space, if you will. Uh, many of us have backgrounds in both chemistry as well as seed. Um, and I think historically biologicals were often positioned as a replacement for chemistry. When in actuality, they're live organisms. They're produced um, as a live organism. They're very similar to seed. Um, and the placement is very similar um, as a result. So we really look at the convergence of the biologicals category agronomic practices, and then the economic output. Many times uh, the market will interpret return on investment simply in terms of the yield right. improvement minus the cost. Uh, we think it's broader than that. When you think about soil health, when you think about nutrient use efficiency as an example, that comprehensive value that's provided at the customer level is bigger than just yield. And that's a, a major talking point because it seems like when markets get tight, when you see commodity prices a little lower than they've been over the most recent years, everybody thinks of, I'm going to yield my way out of this. I want to bushel up, as some of our listeners have talked about. It's nice to put a full comprehensive approach to the value that is being brought as far as your return on investment. So as you and your customers, as you're working for your customers, what are some of the key points that you see DPH working forward on in the future? Well, one example would be um, Teratrove SP1, our biofertilizer product. Um, as we've talked to growers, what we hear is, you know, we hear a lot about buy this, you're going to get an extra four bushel. SP1 can give a yield bump in that range. Um, but what we've also worked towards to satisfy that segment of the market that says basically, I'd like to use biologicals, um, but how can I modify my program so it's not simply an add-on? 
And over three years, we've uh, developed the data package to show that SP1 can replace an equivalent amount of 103040 when used as a liquid in furrow starter fertilizer. So it's part of a program, yep. continued to be used with synthetic fertilizer, but there's an opportunity for that farmer to go towards a more balanced approach that includes the biologicals in conjunction with the fertilizer. I like that approach, Delaney. It's not an add-on. Right. It's a way for them to utilize a biological without extra. And I think just the whole mindset shift of not focusing just on yield as being their ROI is definitely different from how a lot of other biologicals are positioning themselves in the space. And to the point about quantifying it, you're looking at a lot of different factors to help quantify the ROI of the DPH biological lineup. And so when you look at some of the research that's been done, I know you guys have been spending a tremendous amount of time on R&D the last couple of years. I think I read 107 trials. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Mick? Mm -hmm. That's correct, and that's just SP1. Um, and so when we came in uh, to the company, we wanted to ensure that these products were fully developed. And we've got a great uh, field development team led by Alex Cochran. And the first thing we did was start to put uh, the product in well-managed, replicated field trials that are evaluated by experienced scientists that can help us then position where the product best goes. Um, I just saw uh, Dr. Fred Bilo over in a neighboring booth a few minutes ago. We're also working with the University of Illinois as an example, uh, specifically focusing on residue management with our residues complete product. Uh, so that's another example of a collaboration uh, that we have in place to help you know, put the science first and make sure that the customers understand the value provided by the, by the products. Tanner, I was listening to a podcast from I think it was Farm Progress recently, and they were talking to a gal from the Nebraska Research, uh, I think it was the Nebraska Research Program, really looking at and talking about how farmers are really starting to trial biologicals and use these in their operations. Maybe not 100% transitioned acres, but a lot of farmers are really looking to this space to say, how can this impact not just my yields, but my soil health, my plant health, and other things. Mick, how do you go about recommending to farmers to start testing biologicals on their operations? Well, it depends a little bit on their farming system. And first of all, um, at DPH Biologicals, we work to create products that fit into the system. So for example, um, SP1 Classic, when we first uh, joined the company, uh, we would have our calls with farmers and we'd get questions about compatibility with fertilizer, freeze thaw, those things that are relatively simple questions, but many of the biologicals either aren't compatible or they don't know if they are or are not. And so um, number one is we want to fit into the system with how the farmer farms. We don't want it to be an extra um, step in the process, if you will. We don't want them to have to uh, put our products in the refrigerator. So we want to fit in how they farm. And then I would say, you know, some of them have different kind of styles in terms of how quickly they want to ramp. They'll want to see it to believe it, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. We work to have, first of all, local data to help provide the credibility that it is something that they want to trial. And then many of them will trial, uh, you know, one or two totes. Um, oftentimes they'll split a quarter as an example, depending on their setup, they might split a planter um, and take a look at it that way. Um, actually, the question reminds me of a residues complete trial we had um, where the, the farmer sprayed it um, across the rows. Um, and visually looking at it, there was a big question mark if that product was doing anything, but it was the overhead imagery mm -hmm. um, that we sponsored to take a picture of the residue that where you could clearly see the breakdown happening faster where residues complete was applied versus where it was uh, not applied. Well, that's exciting to know that listeners and producers alike can take an advantage of running trials to test something and maybe when it discover it works for them, implore it on more of their acres. So if they do want to look up the products that we've discussed today or DPH Biologicals, how best do they do that? Well, uh, dphbio.com is a great you know door to get in and take a look around. We can help direct them to a local retailer that's supporting our product line. If they're here uh, this week, we're up on the third floor, um, I think row 60, uh, 6400, so they can come see us at our booth um, upstairs. That's great. Well, thank you for spending the time with us here this morning. Really appreciate you sharing all the exciting news that you had. Well, thanks for the partnership. We really enjoy interacting and, and working with you to help farmers 
understand what DPH Biologicals is doing. I think as a management-owned company, we're clearly aligned with the interests of the U.S. Uh, farmer, and we're really excited about the Teratrove and the Bellatrove portfolios. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Tanner, as we look at this week's market headlines, we are just about a week out now from the USDA's first look at the 2024 crop. March 28th, the USDA will release their prospective plantings report, which will give us their first official estimates for what growers will be planting this growing season. AgMarket.net shared their early estimates, putting corn at 91.5 million acres, soybeans at 86.1 million acres, and all wheat acres at 46.2 million acres. Arlen Suderman of Stonex is expecting to see corn planting intentions at 92.1 million acres and soybeans at 85.6 million acres. But of course, there are always surprises. If you recall back to the annual USDA Ag Outlook Forum, USDA suggested we'd see 91 million acres of corn this year, 87.5 million of soybeans, and 47 million acres of wheat. Oh, those are good predictions there. In the greater economy, we saw the Federal Reserve give murky direction as to the future of interest rate cuts, noting that the resilient economy, sticky inflation, and strong jobs report stated there will be many reasons to keep interest rates as is. But the Federal Reserve, in a unanimous decision, stated that they would stay the course with potential for three rate cuts this year regardless, Delaney. Well, it'll be uh, interesting to see if we see those rate cuts come to fruition. But taking a look at the grain markets this week, May corn futures pushed to their highest level in over a month on Thursday, but prices were unable to sustain those moves higher, finishing the day near 440. While weekly exports remain strong, South American weather keeps the markets guessing. And in the soybean pits this week, markets continued to be volatile. Soybean meal and oil have been one of the key focuses here for traders, as well as those export sales numbers, which this week reflected an increase in soybean exports for the 23-24 marketing year. But overall commitments are down 19 percent from where we were a year ago. South American weather has been fairly wet over the last seven days and could cause a harvest delay in both Brazil and Argentina, so traders will be watching that headline as well. But poor weekly export sales reported for all wheat classes this week. Added to the bearish news was the Sov Econ estimates that raised their production numbers for Russian wheat by 1.2 million metric tons. However, there is a sentiment of concern that some winter wheat crops in the southwestern plains could be stressed by the winter storm that is expected to pass here over the next few days. Given the history of hard red winter wheat, the crop has survived much worse conditions than those expected here at the end of March. Overall, winter wheat conditions are in much better shape than they were a year ago, and the wintry mix should also provide some much-needed moisture for some parts of the country, Tanner. So that's a quick look at this week's market summary. That's right. That's the end of our second production of the Ag News show ag news <laughs> daily production again if you're listening to this on the podcast platform thank you so very much but you can also watch us on youtube and you can check out the segment clips on all of our social media platforms i think we're still looking for suggestions for those headlines of the week delaney that's so right if our listeners have those they need to put it in the comment section on either tiktok or instagram or send it to us uh, via email best ways to do it online isn't it correct that's right info at ag news daily you can shoot us a note and we'll see that as well tanner we've already started to get some good feedback from listeners yes. we had a few folks that said they missed the daily podcast so we appreciate the input we might be considering bringing back a market monday oh. episode if you're interested in that let us know again yes. online but otherwise we appreciate the continued support and what do you say tanner we let the folks go for this week let's let them go